Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Dr. Jennifer Willinga, and I'm a professor of communication and culture at Royal Roads University in Victoria, BC. Welcome to the webinar series, Sport, Leadership and Social Change. This is episode eight in the series. And we always begin by acknowledging the land that Royal Roads resides upon. We want to thank the Lekwungen and Kusepsen people, also known as Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations communities for allowing us to live, work, teach, learn and play on their lands. These are unceded territories at Royal Roads University and I myself also live on the same lands of the Kusepsen people in Cadro Bay where I'm working from home and have been for about a year now. We love to give thanks also to the ancestors, supernatural ones, hereditary leaders and matriarchs, creatures big and small for looking after those rich resources and cultural teachings of the beautiful lands. Here I am rowing in the mornings on Elk Lake uh, nearby. And here we are teaching on in the old growth forests that surround our, our campus. We rely so heavily on our location, on our campus grounds on the systems, ecosystems that surround us. And we weave these into the teachings at Rural Roads and the interdisciplinary programs that we offer. And this webinar series is no different, really. It's, it's uh, relying on the teachings of sport. What can we learn from sport that reflects these kind of natural principles that we rely on so heavily? Uh, at Rural Roads, we partner with a number of sport organizations and a number of our, athlete, of our students, actually, our athletes as well. This is Andrea Burke. She'll actually be on this episode of the, the webinar series on Olympism. And uh, she's a grad and kind of a representative of our, of our game plan partnership. So game plan is a federal agency that supports athletes transitioning beyond their career in sport and out into the community and, and help them to leverage what they've learned through sport. And that's my goal with this webinar series as well, to try to help us all to learn from what sport has to offer our communities. So I'm bringing in all sorts of sport leaders, athletes, coaches, uh, media, to talk about the, the key principles that sport can teach us around leadership and social change and the ways that we can do sport better, you know, foster diversity and inclusion in sport, but also through sport, using sport as that lever for change. There are a number of organizations across the world that reflect these same kind of concepts. And I like to illustrate here that these same concepts that sport uh, takes under their arms and, and upholds like development, diversity and inclusion, education, environment, equity and human rights, health, communication and peace, we also reflect within the number of interdisciplinary programs that we offer here at the university. And sport does have power. It can be a lever for change. We've seen the athletes, particularly during COVID, but I think for, for hundreds of years, use their platform to speak up. And uh, they've faced a number of challenges in doing so, uh, not, to, not to mention uh, Rule 50 that they're battling right now at the Olympics. And we'll talk about lots of these things in the, in the next couple of episodes. I always like to highlight that uh, within my school of communication and culture, this is kind of another paradigm on which I, I, uh, der I derive a lot of the, the ideas that I try to bring to this webinar series. And one of our main metaphors within the school is the bridge, that in order to achieve any kind of real understanding, we need to bridge the gaps between ourselves, between groups and communities, countries and, and individuals. And a bridge can be as simple as a handshake uh, or a pat on the back or a high five, but it's also, you know, these actual structures that we try to build. In building bridges, we have to understand that first we need to acknowledge our differences, the, the gaps between us that we're trying to bridge. Uh, and that means acknowledging our diversity. It starts with that before we can start to uh, try to connect with one another. We need to understand our differences. So in this episode, we're going to be tackling Olympism, and this is part one of two. I'm, I'm structured these so that they span the actual Olympics and Paralympics, and that during this time, we will have lots of stories, I'm sure, to reflect on once the Olympics begin in Tokyo. But man, we have a lot to reflect on already because throughout this past year and a half, we've been you know, delaying the Olympics is one of the first things that got delayed, really. And Canada, of course, was a real leader in doing so and saying that we will not be sending our 
athletes to the Olympics in 2020 because of COVID. And of course, they were soon followed by multiple nations. But I, I love the leadership that uh, Trisha Smith and the COC illustrated in doing so. We'll have lots of things to reflect on as we prepare for the Olympic Games to happen in Tokyo. And I've invited uh, a few guests for this first episode to talk about media, the role of media, uh, the role of commentary, the role of storytelling. I have Adam Creek with me today, and we will be uh, discussing sport in general for him and his role as an athlete. He was a two-time Olympian and gold medalist, but also as a commentator and interviewer and podcaster around the um, topic of sport, I really wanna dig into what Adam tries to bring in his storytelling. And we will uh, have about an hour with Adam. This is a special bonus feature where Adam will be quite busy as a commentator during the Olympics. So I haven't been able to uh, nab him for the webinar itself, but we'll be having this wonderful interview. And actually, I really appreciate these because it gives us a chance to dig into things quite deeply with, with one individual. So welcome, Adam. Welcome, Adam. Great to see you. Thank you so much for spending the time with me today. And we'll be talking about a lot of different things. I wanted to first start though with a bit of a, you know, I've introduced you in the prelude generally, but I also want to hear from you. You know, why sport for you? What has sport meant to you? And how did you get into it? Tell us a little bit about that story of sport in Adam Creek's life. Well, I think sport is interesting because the athlete journey is so different for so many people. And I was, I came into sport hearing one common narrative of, you know, I was a child, I dreamed that I wanted to be an Olympian. And then I worked really hard and I became an Olympian and I lived the childhood dream. And, and that is not me. <laughs> yeah, so let me, let me tell you my story and you know, my journey, uh, you know, for me, it was, you know, I grew up in a relatively large family or large for now, nowadays, I had three uh, older siblings and two older sisters and older brother. And uh, I didn't really like sport. And I think part of it was that I was just kind of the beaten up younger child who was never allowed to, you know, to win competitions with his older brother or older sisters. And uh, I just, I wasn't interested. I know my parents, you know, believed in the power of sport. My dad was an old basketball athlete. Um, my mom you know, didn't identify very much as, a, as an athlete. Her claim to fame was a, a running trophy she won in grade seven, and then she stopped all athletics after that. <laughs> but as I, as I went through elementary school, there was little desire for sport, but my you know, parents put me in sports camps and you know, just to keep me active, I was a very energetic and active child. Um, you know, maybe nowadays I would have been classified as you know, an ADHD type kid, although you know, I'm you know, hesitant to, to go by that moniker, but I, you know, needless to say, I had a lot of energy. And I was lucky enough to have gone to a small school where they, they required every child to play on the sports team if they were ever able to field a sports team. So I, I, you know, I played youth basketball and I played on my uh, elementary basketball team. And then there was a summer camp, and this is the introduction to rowing, where it was held at the University of Western, uh, where I grew up in London, Ontario. And I used to do all different types of sports. They do the sports smorgasbord. But in the summers, I'd go camping with my father and my brother. We'd go canoeing. And there, there was this opportunity to go rowing. So why don't you go rowing for a week? At, you know, the Doc Fitzjames Boathouse uh, you know, on Fanshawe Lake. So, okay, I'll, I'll show up. And I, I remember showing up and uh, the, the you know, the instructors saying, wow, like, look at your body type. You just, you fit right into this whole rowing thing. And me just looking at them thinking, okay, this is just a fun thing to do. And so I hopped in the boat and I did that for a week and then didn't think much of it. And then when I moved into high school, I think I recognized the, the balancing effect that activity had on my ability to concentrate in school. So I, 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 you know, I signed up for football, uh, American football, played basketball, and in the spring I threw the discus and the shot put. And uh, I had maybe the worst <laughs> discus coach ever. 
<laughs> and what he would do is he'd take me and he, he didn't believe in me. He didn't have any faith in me and he didn't even train me. He would, he would give me the discus and be like, okay, throw this. And he'd leave me to just do my own thing. And then I remember at the, we had the city championships and I placed fourth, like the throwing and he can't. And I was like, hey, I placed fourth. I think I have to go to some other track meet up. He's like, what? <laughs> you like, you did something? <laughs> <laughs> and so that was that put me off for track and field for the spring sport and I didn't do a spring sport in the year of grade 10 and then in grade 11 uh, one of the girls at my school her father was an old rower he rode at university and he rode at the local rowing club which is now defunct in London Ontario the London Rowing Club or at least where it is it used to be on the on the Thames River but the dam is has now been disbanded and then he started up the, the, you know, the sport of rowing at the high school. And, it, and again, it was something, I was motivated to do it because they, uh, you know, the head coaches that had believed in me and said I had potential in it. But then I just thought, you know, this will give me fitness and strength for football and basketball. I think this is, you know, this is just a good part of, you know, the three sports system, you know, football, basketball, rowing. Okay, let's do this. And I can lift weights when I row and I really like lifting weights. So let's, you know, let's get really fit. And I ended up getting really fit and really surprising my football coaches after a couple of seasons of rowing because I'd show up and I just wouldn't stop. I'd have such massive you know, strength of aerobic capacity from the sport of rowing. And then after rowing for about two years, my coach, Walt Benko, he takes me aside and he says, Adam, you're an Olympian. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> Because <laughs> I didn't, right? I was, you know, like I said, I wasn't the kid who saw the Olympics and dreamed of the Olympics that this is what I want to do. Again, it was just, you know, sport was something I knew I needed in my life to create balance to achieve the other things that I wanted to achieve in my life. And, and where it went from there is, you know, I had a great coach and he actually said, don't push too hard in high school because you peak in this sport in your late 20s. So I want you to really just have fun with this, get fit, get a sense of it. And if you want to take this to the next level, which you have the ability to do, you can do that in university and then beyond. Uh, but in high school, I really want you to just, just get a sense of not burn out from this, the sport because I see a potential in you that I don't want to be wasted. And so I'm really grateful for that advice too. <clears throat> so I went, I went through high school. After high school, I took a break. I just, I was, I was done with school. I wanted to uh, make some money. Uh, you know, I was going to be supporting myself through university anyways. So I went, I moved to the north of Alberta and I started working on an oil rig. So I worked on an oil rig, you know, cold, heavy steel, you know, you know, swearing, cussing, drinking, drugs, whoring, you know, everything you can imagine in the, the oil patch, it was there. And, you know, I had a, you know, call it a come to Jesus moment, you know, one time in the dead of winter, I was thinking this is, you know, this is really horrendous. I think I should, um, I think I should go back to this rowing. I'm missing something with the sport. I'm not done with that, my athletic journey. And I think it will help fuel my academic journey. And at that time, I wanted to go into, you know, resource extraction. And I decided I wanted to go into geotechnical engineering. So I came down to the University of Victoria, where I trained for a couple of years under Howie Campbell and started my degree in geotechnical engineering. But Mike Spracklin had come in and there were some really great athletes at the training center, you know, Andrew Hoskins, Kevin Light, Joe Stankovicius, and they encouraged me to come and, and train more with the national team. And as I did and got exposed to it, I thought, well, this is, this is potential. There's potential here to be realized and there's nothing more motivating, especially for a young athlete as unrealized potential. So I dropped out of school after two years and then trained full time uh, with the national team. And we had good success. We won world championships under 23 in 2001, won world championships 2002, 2003. Then we went to the Olympics 2004 and had a crushing failure. And at the end of that, I thought, I'm done. I'm done with sport. You know, this was too much work. This was too much effort. I need to move on and see, lick my wounds and see what this gave me. And what it did give me was the opportunity to go down to, uh, you know, America, to California, where I trained with uh, the University of Stanford. I finished my geotechnical engineering degree. I was able to, you know, be a bit of a player coach. I was you know, about four or five years older, had a lot of, a lot more experience as an athlete and a leader. So I was able to, you know, 
you know, lead a lot of these guys and show them what it meant to be a good rower and the kind of you know, discipline and ethic required to, you know, to find excellence. And, and these guys were truly inspirational. They ended up the year after I left, <laughs> you know, I was still there training on my own, but I couldn't compete, but the, they ended up winning silver at the national championships, which was really neat. And then six of the guys ended up competing at the Olympics afterwards. So that was really neat to see. So the, you know, a bit of a torch passing and, uh, that was, that was a really great experience. And that's what actually rekindled my uh, interest in you know, the Olympic journey, I suppose, because the youthful excitement of the younger athletes who were just discovering things reminded me of, of, of how I was at the start of my journey. And then the, you know, Spracklin was putting together a group and I was, and I'd kind of moved from, I say, a leadership role at Stanford into you know, just being one of the guys again on the national team squad. And I really liked that. I like being part of a team, uh, very, you know, team oriented and some very inspiring, you know, great athletes, you know, Kyle Hamilton had really come on. Jake Wetzel had joined our boat. And so we had a really good shot. And so after the Olympic or after Stanford, I had the opportunity to get a fully funded master's degree on scholarship uh, or go to the Olympics. And so that was a tough decision, but I ended up going to the Olympics, glad I did it. Um, you know, and then we ended up, we won the world championships, we won the world cup, we won the, we had a great couple of years. And then we ended up winning the Olympics, which was a, a true thrill. And then, you know, post Olympics, <clears throat> you, know, was, you know, you almost have to decompress and figure out what the Olympic journey means to you and how you can build a longer relationship with the sport. And to a certain extent, there's an element of trauma that you experience, you know, un, you know unexpressed pain, a pain that you didn't know how to talk about or process that you experience through high performance training. And that's, I think that's the nature of high performance training. And that's the nature of excellence because you have to, you have to control uh, a lot of what you're doing. And the, and the best medicine I found for that was adventure, you know, adventure therapy. And that prompted about a five-year mission for me to, um, you know, I teamed up with a couple gentlemen from Seattle and we put together a program to row from Africa to Miami in a rowboat. And so that started with a lot of smaller expeditions where we went around the Puget Sound in the Pacific Northwest, down the west coast of Washington. We circumnavigated Vancouver Island on a rowboat, and then we eventually went across the ocean. Our, our ocean road didn't end so well. We capsized in the Bermuda Triangle. We ended up getting rescued. Nobody died, which made it end perfectly. <laughs> Everyone was healthy. Uh, but it really gave me context as to the you know, the nature of the sport and what it gave to me. And I, I, I came to see my sport as a, as a spiritual discipline, as a piece of me, as something that, you know, I would stay connected to uh, for the rest of my life. And where it evolved to from there was, uh, as I got involved with a local boat maker, because, uh, well, ironically, you know, you're an athlete, and you're not making a lot of money, but I wanted access to equipment and I still wanted to get out on the ocean. I enjoyed connection with nature. So I struck a deal with a local boat maker. He'd give me access to his boats and I could take his boats out, go crab fishing, go camping, go exploring the, you know, the coast and, you know, the closer wilderness to, you know, Victoria where I lived. And so I, I we did a lot of tradesies for a while, and then I ended up just actually getting involved in the business of, uh, you know, helping to promote these recreational rowboats, <clears throat> and that's, I suppose, where I am now, where I'm, uh, yeah, I'm involved in recreational rowing, where it's, you know, people who aren't involved in a club, I'd say of the people who use our equipment, one third of them have never ever rowed before. And this is, you know, the oar board and the Whitehall Spirit rowing, if, it, if you want to check out the boats that they have. But, uh, you know, one third of them have never actually rowed before. A third of them, you know, used to row in, 
you know, dory style boats, like the big tin boats like this when they were a kid. They're just looking for a way to reconnect. And a third of them did some sort of flat water rowing when they were <clears throat> when they were younger. And now that they're in their middle age, they're looking for something that's stable, the, a piece of equipment that they can use independently. They don't have to be part of a club. They can use it when they want to. It's fully transportable, easy to store. So I'm you know, I'm fascinated by that and the ability of, uh, you know, of the sport to hold different places in my life. So if we kind of sum, like sum it up a little bit, you know, as a child, sport was almost a balancing force that allowed me to, to focus academically on what was expected of me in spite, you know, despite my, my large energy system and, uh, and you know, kind of my nature. And then uh, how, what it evolved to was a pursuit of excellence and a pursuit of self-exploration. You know, what, what can I achieve? What can I do? And it, it pushed me through extreme highs and extreme lows as high performance sport do, does because you have very high expectations and with high expectations either come high satisfaction or devastating <laughs> depressions when you don't achieve what your expectations have. And learning, you know, what you need to do to enact discipline and uh, endurance and perseverance, and uh, you, know, you know what sort of values are established. And then, you know, moving on to the adventure stage, it was more about exploration and, and using something you knew to, you know, to explore, to give back. We had a lot of uh, community programs that were uh, done in association with our. Uh, a rowing journey. Uh, we had a very strong uh, education component to it. And then now as a, you know, you know, now that I'm in middle age and helping other middle aged people, you know, connect with sport, you know, it's about transcendence. It's about connection. And there's an element of transcendence that occurs at all levels of the journey. Uh, but transcendence occurs in, in different ways <laughs> at different stages in life. And uh, uh, and so now it's, you know, staying fit, staying active, staying connected, um, you know, figuring out, you know, your, you know, your humble place in the broader picture of, of this planet. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I suppose is the, you know, my journey through sport and what it's delivered. And it's just become a you know, and, that, and I come back to this idea that's been a, more of a spiritual discipline than a than a physical discipline. And you know, the physical discipline and the mental discipline is, is an entree and is a door into uh, a spiritual awakening and uh, an ability to access groundedness and and wholeness. And and that's truly the biggest gift of sport that I've seen, uh, you know, on my personal journey. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. It's such a great story, you know, and that's what I really want to ask you about today, too, is it's the power of these stories. And, and it's so unique, right? The, the patterns that you follow, the pathways you follow, your introduction. Love it. And I'm sure people are resonating with different parts of your story. It sure sparked memories for me, too. Thank you. That was a really great introduction. And I love the principles that you've distilled from each of those parts of your journey, right? I love this concept of the spiritual exploration, how you can use sport for different reasons. How long did it take you to, to distill that? You know, do you feel like you were learning as you went, or is it something you took some time? You talked about that decompression point, you know, did you do some? Well, it took. Well, it took a long time to decompress and I felt compelled, you know, so, you know, after the Olympics, I got, you know, I didn't end up moving into geotechnical engineering. I, I moved, I, I started a biofuel company and started conference uh, speaking, which moved into conference training, where it's my current major profession, excuse me, which is executive, executive business coaching. Uh, so that, that took a little bit of a a turn, but because I was taking that path, I felt, and I was using my story as an analogy and a metaphor for, for better business, for better careers, uh, better lives, I felt compelled to write a book to, you know, to communicate some of these ideas. So the, 
it, it probably took a decade to really be able to wrap it all together and gain meaning from that and understand the patterning that arised or that arose from, you know, from those experiences. Mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, it takes a lot of time for reflection and certainly the time, you know, the time I've spent in the wilderness, you know, in the ocean and the mountains and, you know, in the woods, away from people, away from society with, you know, more in touch with, you know, deeper thought. That's, that's where I've been able to make more of the connections as to, you know, you know, what is the purpose? What is the meaning? You know, what, what's the purpose of sport? And what's the meaning of sport? And what is the purpose of my athletic journey? When you're young, you are compelled to take an athletic journey because of the elders in your community. Your elders are pushing you to do that. You know, it was my parents, it was my coaches, it was my teachers. They, they all said, go to sport. Sport has what you need. And they saw it in me and it did have something that I needed. But now on the other side, as I'm stepping into that elder role, I have children of my own, I'm teaching others and you're passing on that wisdom and I'm compelling other people to go to sport, that you have to go through a bit of, or at least I do, <laughs> to figure out like, why am I pushing people towards sport? What is the purpose of this? Because you can see, it's really easy to be critical. It's very easy to be cynical and see you know, the negative aspects of sport and high-performance sport. Yet I am a firm believer, you know, after you know, reflection that there's, you know, the benefits far outweigh the, you know, the criticisms. Yeah, and so this intentionality, you know, you've woven in storytelling for yourself, you know, and the distillation, the crystallization of these learnings that was built into your life. And I think that's a really great piece of advice for, for high performance athletes, you know, to do things that force you to actually distill the learning and reflect, but also the space, right? Give yourself the space and time to actually learn and reflect on what it, what it means. And I mean, God, as society, we could probably use with a bit of space to reflect on why the Olympics, you know, and I want to go there next. So it's interesting, you differentiated in your story a little bit about World Cup, World Champs, and then we get to the Olympics and slightly different. I've heard lots of athletes describe the two experiences different. And of course, we're, we're anticipating the Olympic Games. There's been surrounded with controversy and challenges, and we'll get into those too. But uh, why the Olympics? You know, what did it mean to you in the end? And why Olympism? How is it different? Is it different? Why is it important? You've talked about the benefits outweighing well, well, society is like an onion and we're, you know, at the center of the onion, let's just say it's, it's us, it's the strong individual. And then um, I'll we'll use rowing as, as an example. And then, then you move in and you're competing. You say, I'm the individual and I'm, I'm competing in my single and I'm competing on the rowing machine and I'm competing in the weight room. And then I make a boat. So I'm part of my crew. Right. And so I'm part of my crew and my crew, there's still some competitive. I want to beat the other crews. I want to, like, if I'm in the men's eight, I want to be more successful than the women's eight or the men's four or the single, like that's just the nature of it. You know, it's competitive and ah, I'm going to try to get up to the top of the hierarchy and, and that's, it's fun and it's good. And, and through that striving, we learn a lot, but then you go to a world championships and then you're with your sport. And so you're, okay, I'm with the team and I have to find a way to be supportive of the other boats and okay, go supportive of the, you know, of the women's eight and the single and the four and the the whatever. And, and that, but as you're competing with the world, then you start to recognize there's other athletes from other countries that instantly, and this, this even blows my mind to this day, I can talk to someone from South Africa or Peru or China or Australia or wherever and Instantly, because we have the history of rowing, we have something in common where the conversation then flows and the relationship is built much quicker. And so we have this, you know, world championships, world cups is still very sport insular. And then when you go to the Olympics, there's, there's this inclusion aspect where it's, you know, all the different sports from your country and all the different sports from around the world. And there's, there is very much the global feel, everyone united through this pursuit of athletics. You know, and we talk about the, 
you know, the three values of the Olympic movement, which are, you know, excellence, friendship, and respect. And those tend to be, you know, truly, I think, what should drive the Olympic movement. You know, this pursuit of excellence, which gives space for that competitive nature, the, the ability to, to beat other people, to better yourself. Um, but the friendship and the respect as parts of it, you know, respecting one another, respecting the environment that we're competing in. Um, and obviously the friendship, because when, when you go to hell with your friends and come back, they, they're even better friends. When you go to the top of the mountain and come back, they're even better friends. So I think that there's, and then you, you know, again, this ability to, to cross cultural lines, regardless of, you know, race, creed, sexual orientation, or, or what have you, um, the, you know, you know, the ideal is that we're all the same under sport. Yeah, and it, it's not, you know, there's a lot of complexities, and I'm sure we could talk for hours about that, why that's not, not lived, but that is certainly the ideal and, and what we strive for. And I think that there's, um, you know, there's something to be said about, you know, the, the awakening that occurs through the athletic journey. And I'll also say that the athletic journey in a, you know, in our modern society, that we lack rituals and we, we lack a coming of age ritual, you know, whereas in generations past or in smaller cultures, you would have, you know, you have moved from childhood to adulthood and you've had to go through this test and you're now an adult, you know, you've had to go to battle and you've gone to battle and you've killed someone and now you're an adult or you've you know you've had a child and now you've pushed out that child and through the screaming bloody mess you are now an adult or whatever they have for these you know these coming of age but you know we don't go to war we don't have kids when we're young so how do we um how do we create adults that can, that can move into society. And I feel like sport is a way to really dial you in and recognize there are real consequences to your action. So if you are an athlete and you do not train, you will not get the results of the sport. And that's, you know, that's adulting. You know, that's, that's putting in your big boy pants, your big girl pants. And it's, it's recognizing that also some things are out of your control. You can show up to every practice, train as hard as you can, and then fall flat on your face for no reason other than it's just bad luck. And you have to learn how to, how to deal with that, how to deal with this disappointment. Uh, you, you have to learn how to deal with success, right? You find success as an athlete and you recognize that, you know, that the success hasn't really given me what I thought it would give me. I thought it would, you know, deliver me something and I wanted it and I got it, but the, like, at the end, it's just a completion and an, an emptiness and, you know, life moves on. So we have to figure out what, what's that deeper purpose that we're serving? You know, what's the, you know, what are the values that we're trying to live? You know, what are, what's, what's the life we're trying to lead? And I feel like the Olympic movement, you know, and I guess to step back to your question, because I went on a bit of a tangent here, but the Olympic movement is very, is very inclusive and it allows individuals to, to go on that athletic journey. And from a grander scheme, it allows a coming of age event for, for young people across the globe. And it allows to create, um, you, know, you know, stronger adults uh, who are more able to contribute to a broader sense of society, you know, above and beyond, you know, the nature of sport, you know, and there's something to be said sport for its own sake, but, you know, sport for the grander sake is certainly what interests me and what keeps me involved in, you know, in the movement and promoting, uh, promoting yeah. sport to the next and the generation. Learning, the learning is crucial in that, that crystallization of the actual, the lessons you've learned from it, right, are so crucial. Love this idea of it being powerful because it offers this ritual you know it, it is an ideal and it it shows the world how to strive together you know that it relies on respect and friendship for you to achieve excellence you need to each other and i love rugby for that right the scrum you're actually interdependent but also this idea that you know it's um it's a way for people to adult like sport is an avenue and i think we know that intrinsically but we probably don't say it enough what was one of the biggest life lessons, the adulting moment through sport or that sport gave you? 
You mm-hmm. talked about 2004, the crushing defeat. It's probably uh, one of the bigger moments in your in your life, but also there were a million of them, I'm sure. But mm-hmm. whatever you want to talk about, what's something that you well, really struggle with? Well, I write about it in my book. You know, I think one of the biggest adulting experiences I had was the, you know, and I'm just trying to look for the, you know, the language. And how about I just, I tell a story because that'll, <laughs> that's a better story. So the, you know, usually we would compete at Lucerne World Championships or Lucerne World Cup before we go to the World Championships or even the Olympics. And it was before the, uh, the World Championships in 2003, you know, we'd, we went and we had a great race. We had won in the eight, it was wonderful. Uh, my teammate and I decided that we wanted to, um, you know, climb to the top of this mountain, Mount Pilatus after the, after the race. And then afterwards we were gonna to go to Mr. Pickwit's bar. And we we're gonna have some beers and have some fun, hang out, which was, which was all good. But there's an element of, you know, rigidity and you know, predictability and discipline that's needed to be, um, you know, to you know, to be at the top and to achieve that performance. But to a certain extent, you know, I was so much of a free spirit that I was that it was um, an adaptation of, can I say, my natural state, which was one of like free flying, go with the flow sort of thing. Like I just just want to go here, go there. I don't want to think about it. I just want to, you know, be in the moment, be present all the time, have fun, have a lot of energy, which, which is great up to a point, you know? And, and so we go up, we climb to the top of the, the mountain and we had decided to bring a bottle of absinthe with us, like just a big bottle of, you know, wormwood, go see the green fairy and, and thought, okay, this would be a great idea to you know, to bring it up and that way we get to the top of the mountain, we climb down and then we can make sure we're caught up by the time we get to the bar because we don't want to be left behind. We want to be in the same state that everyone else is. <laughs> so we get to the top, we didn't quite get to the top of the mountain. We get above the tree line, start drinking the absinthe and then turns out like doing a massive rowing race, climbing halfway up a, lot, a mountain, not eating a whole lot and then drinking some absinthe is a recipe for uh, disaster. So, you know, less thought, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> and so what ended up happening, I, you know, I blacked out, I ran away from my, uh, my friend that I was climbing the mountain with, I woke up in a cardboard box, uh, the following morning wrapped in plastic <laughs> on, the, on uh, you know, just off the side of the, of the mountain. And I missed the plane, but my crew had left without me. Uh, and so I ended up getting I found my, I hitchhiked my way back to the city. I, I got a train, went to the uh, airport, like paid something like $600 to change my flight with money I didn't have at the time. And then, um, you know, found my way, you know, ended up finding my way home. I ended up getting picked up by a supporter, a friend of my coach, uh, this guy, Larry Tracy. He saw me in the airport. He's like, you, you don't look so good. What happened? I was like, well, this is what happened. I, you know, I drank too much. I got lost. And I had like scrapes and scratches all over me because I was falling down the mountain. And um, it was, you know, it could have been really dangerous. And more than that, it was, you know, disrespectful to my team. It was disrespectful to, um, you know, everyone else. And then on, on top of it, it, it really made me question, like, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, why am I putting myself through so much structure and discipline that I feel the need to explode in this way afterwards. And I don't even think that this journey is for me. I don't think this journey is for me because it is too restrictive. And I remember afterwards, I showed up for the practice and my coach laid into me. He's like, you don't want this. You don't like, you know, you obviously don't have what it takes to be an Olympic gold medalist. And normally when he would say that, it would just be like a giant, like, fuck you, I do. Right. But at that point in time, I was like, no, I don't. Right. I don't. You're right. And so I stopped. The moment he said that, I stopped. I went into the dock. I packed up my things and I left. And I was like, I'm done. I'm over. There's like, there is no more of this journey for me whatsoever. And I was like, what am I going to do now? And, you know, I got, you know, I walked home. It was like maybe, uh, you know, know, an 18 kilometer walk home. And so I'm kind of walking home. And then I stop on this bench and there's this, um, there's this first nation guy with bottles and I sit down beside him on the, on the bench and he looks at me. He's like, Oh, 
you don't look so good, man. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't feel good. And he's like, well, what happened? It's like, well, I just, you know, I drank too much. I let down my friends. I don't feel like I'm in the right place. And he's like, yeah, you know, I feel that way sometimes too. <laughs> I was just like, that's just what I needed, right? Thank you, man. And so I kind of, I move on and then I think, yeah. And I'm trying to think what, you know, what's the purpose of this journey? What's the purpose of being here? I don't know. And I'm sort of I'm thinking it through and then I'm getting some calls from my teammates saying, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Are you coming back? And I'm just, I don't really know. And they said, well, you should call, you should call our coach. And our coach wasn't the kind who would ever reach out. You know, you had to have the initiative to reach out to him to show that you had the initiative and the desire to actually, you know, take it to the next level. And so eventually I call him up, say, okay, we need to have a meeting. And at that time, I even thought that, that was, this was going to be my resignation letter. I was going to be like, okay, this is over. I'm not a good fit. This is obviously, I'm not a, I, this this journey isn't a fit for who I am. And, you know, the Olympic journey is for a different type of person than me. You know, people who are more disciplined, more focused, they don't mess up in the way that I mess up. Like there's like, just let me be my free spirit self and I'll like, goodbye and thank you, you know, whatever it was gonna be. But we had the conversation and we like, I didn't have, it was kind of like a breakup conversation, didn't have the courage, so we eat. And then my coach had this habit of giving, like he would not, he'd order a big plate of food and eat like a small amount and then give the food to the athlete. And it was, a, it was kind of an endearing um, uh, trait that he had. So he gave me some extra food and I ate it. And then he was like, well, you know, if you feel like you've learned your lesson, we, we want to have you back. And I think you could contribute to it. And, I, and just the extension of forgiveness and understanding was, um, I think, what I needed, you know, to know that, okay, I can be un imperfect. I can be someone who gets, who doesn't hit the mark and still, and still be on the journey, right? I can endure personal failures. I can endure private failures. I can endure public failures and still, guess what? I can still have the goal and I can still go towards that goal. <laughs> and so I think when we talk about adulting and what as the Olympic journey taught, you know, from that story and that lesson is that, you, you know, as adults, we're not, we still aren't gonna hit the mark. We're still gonna fall off. We're still not, not gonna be, you know, that perfect Patty or that, you know, like superstar Steve or whatever we want to be, like there's sometimes just not going to hit it. And sometimes it's going to feel out of alignment. But if we're, but if we can be honest with ourselves and do some of the hard work, making sure that, you know, our purpose is in alignment with our values, that our goals are in alignment with our values, that, you know, we recognize that we're human and fallible, that, you know, we can grow and mature, you know, beyond that point. And so I think that's, you know, that's the type of, of, of lesson that I think sport can, de can deliver and to force you into that next level of, uh, of responsibility. And I suppose that's why the, you know, the book I wrote is called The Responsibility Ethic, you know, you know reflecting upon my, you know, on my athletic journey. It's, and I talk about that and I call it The Responsibility Ethic because you know, each and every one of us in our life has things that we can control and things that we can't control, right? We were raised in certain families. We were born with certain personalities. We have certain ways that we've been established uh, that we have, that we operate, yet we have the ability to choose our response to those given situations. You know, we can focus on what we can control. We can focus on our locus of control and the athletic journey more than anything else because of the because of the challenge, because of the pressure, because of the um, you know, persistence that's required, puts us to the edge of our comfort zone where we have to truly grab hold of these timeless philosophies that have worked for people who've endured much harder challenges than us. You know, as, as athletes, you have to recognize that it is a gift, it is a privilege, you know, maybe the top 10 or 20% of the human population who could even 
dream to compete in athletic, you know, Olympic athletics because of the resources required for it. But what it, um, but what the athletic journey does afford is, you know, very real feelings of challenge and very real experiences of challenge and failure and obstacles through which you can choose your response. And that's what I call the responsibility ethic. It's, you know, it's, it's acknowledging that you've, you have the ability to, you know, to reflect, to make amends, to make better choices, and to um, you know, be the best person you can be, you know, given the circumstances that you've been, you know, that you found yourself under. Right on, love it. And love this concept of that you, that you distilled again, right? The imperfect, I'm imperfect, but I can still be on the journey. I can still have the goal. Have you found yourself applying that concept in another realm of your life or share, you know, obviously you share it with those you coach and, and speak to and in your, and through your book and your writings, but where else has it popped up for you in a completely different environment or context from sport where you've gone, Oh, I know this thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, parenting, parenting business is another one, right? So the, you know, parenting, you go, you know, like you lose it on your kids. You want to be, you know, that, you know, stoic, mindful parent who's giving guidance and, you know, calm in the face of, you know, the ridiculousness that, you know, that children create. And that, that's not possible, I don't think, at, at, you know, to be the perfect parent at every given time. So it's, you know, it's having that, you know, self-compassion and self-forgiveness. And then even, you know, within the business journey, right? I've had a number of business ventures that I've pursued that have, you know, have failed, that have gone through bankruptcy, that have been, you know, that haven't worked out the way that I wanted them to work out. You know, I've had clients that I've let down. I've had, you know, deliverables that I haven't hit. And the, you know, you can let that destroy you or you can learn from it, you can grow from it and you can, um, where it is a bag of honor or badge of honor. And I think to a certain extent, you know, there's a lot of talk about failure and there's a lot of, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, aphorisms out there. And especially when you're young and before you've, you've really felt the deep feelings of, of a strong failure, you, you look at it and you think it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, yet as you age and you have more life experience, you start to recognize the truth. And then when you're living, you think of like the Michael Jordan quote, you know, you know, I'm so excellent because I've missed so many shots. You say, well, it's, that's great for you to say, Michael Jordan, you know, best in the world, but you, know, you don't understand what I'm going through, you know, little old me in my own corner. And so as you're living through, it actually gives you a chance to make peace with those, with those aphorisms and with those bite-sized pieces of philosophy and recognize the, um, you know, the power that it delivers and because you've had those experiences in sport as a 16 year old as a 20 year old as a 24 year old you know guess what you've got a leg up you know when it comes to resilience and you've got a leg up when it comes to a sense of groundedness and putting you know these life experiences into perspective so that's the you know that's one of the gifts of sport and the gifts of the sporting journey and i think there's you know, there's really high correlations between individuals who have played university athletics and their success as, as executives, as leaders, as entrepreneurs. And you know, it's very proven within the scientific literature. And I think experientially from what I see as well, it's, uh, you know, sport isn't the only way to access this, but it is a surefire way to, um, to give yourself a good chance you know, to find some of these learnings. Yeah, good leg up. I like that. And, and uh, love these examples. And I'm sure so many people would really appreciate the fact your humbleness and your authenticity and be able to share that, yeah, I've had my share of failures, but, but you've chosen your response. And that's where we truly have a lot of power. But sport, yes, yeah, sport can be an awesome avenue. But I mentioned earlier that there are negatives too, right? There, and things get corrupted and taken off the rails. And the Olympics is an example of that. What needs to be in place, do you think? What's the biggest opportunity in sport right now to really ensure that we're leveraging sport 
in all these ways you're describing, you know, as a journey, as learning, as these life lessons, as adulting, ritualistic kind of life, loss of innocence, but also, you know, life affirming moments in our lives. What, what needs to be in place or what could be added or real? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it just comes, like these sorts of conversations are helpful. Education is good. You can see how, um, you know, athletes become the coaches that they were coached to become. And so the type of coach that is needed now is not necessarily the coach that was needed 30 years ago, is not the type of coach that was needed 80 years ago. It's a different world in a different environment. You know, sport, you know, at its origin was, you know, was often construed as preparation for war. So you, whereas now, you know, Olympic sport, whereas it falls into its, you know, the ideals of peace, and we talk about excellence, um, respect, and friendship, uh, it's a different style of coaching that's needed to, you know, I guess to reinforce the social ideals and the social values that we want to see lived um, on a broader stage. So, yeah, and again, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the world of coaching education. And from what I see externally, I, I see a lot of very positive um, developments in that realm in the, you know, the requirements of coaches to be fully educated. You know, there's been a big push recently about inclusion and making sure that we're, you know, being kind and respectful and making sure that we don't have any unconscious biases that are shutting people out. And, uh, um, you know, that sort of thing, you know, there's yet I see there's, it's almost, it can be a double-edged sword because, you know, you go down the path of, of inclusion and bringing people together. Uh, sport also has a natural, you know, exclusionary side to it, um, and a very brutal, competitive, aggressive side to it. And I think that there, we need to have place for, you know, brutal aggression within the context of sport. So there's sometimes I see it going too far over towards, um, you know. Kind, kindness and compassion. I, I don't know if that's, <laughs> which seems weird as I, as I talk through it, but it's, I think this is a longer conversation than any conclusion we have today, but the, like there need, it's, you know, and maybe it's kind of like a yin and a yang you know, because you have like, there needs to be a space for um, this aggression and violence and destruction to be expressed in a way that is healthy yeah. and sport is a very good way to do that and i'm you know i'm thinking specifically young men you know who cause most of the violence and destruction in our society say aged 18 to 25 and i think there's there needs to be a space for the masculine within sport and i think that it's it's being pushed out to a certain extent and i don't I don't have the answer. That's just something that I'm, you know, I've been observing that it's it's slowly being pushed out of the nature of sport, and that space needs to be there. Otherwise, you know, young men won't won't find the same sort of fulfillment that they have in ages past, and they'll find other ways to express that, you know, that aggression, that competition, that violence, and I think that that there needs to be, we need to be intelligent about how we continue to grow. And it's, like I said, I don't know the answer. I'm just. Um, yeah, but I think you're describing that reflective time. Like, let's really reflect on what sport's for, the purpose of it. Let's remember what sport is and make sure we honor those elements that we've always loved. Like I think of rugby, you know, I it wouldn't be rugby if you couldn't tackle someone. The whole point of it is, you know, um, is quite a violent and aggressive, but not to harm, right? You're not trying to break someone's neck. And so there's a beautiful illustration of, of how we balance those things that are all kind of inherent within, within us as human beings. But it takes time to reflect on it. We're having the conversation. So that needs to happen, the space. And now there's a role for media, right? So here's uh, the platform in which we're having the conversations about the ability to protest, the ability to, 
uh, to really push the limits, um, to be violent. You know, we're talking about concussions now. Where is the balance between the violence and the harm? And uh, great, great conversations. And, and you're playing a role in media. You're a podcaster, you're an interviewer, you, you're often brought in to commentate at, at games and you're going to be commentating at the next games. What, um, what's, what's your role? You know, we've talked before we started today, we had a little conversation about telling the stories, make sure the stories are getting out there. You shared lots of stories, which is why I host these webinars, right? To get these kind of concepts. I think the learning happens through the stories, but yeah, what's, what's the role you wanna play? Well, as, you know, as a commentator, it's simply to highlight the achievements and celebrate the athletic journey. And I think there is, you know, we can talk a lot about the philosophy of sport, but at the end of the day, the, the competitive experience is, is real and it's entertaining and it's engaging. So I'd say, first off, as a color commentator at the Olympics, it's simply just to be lost in the excellence of performance and find a way to communicate that in a way that as people are watching, they can be drawn a little bit deeper. Uh, so very simply, that is um, you know, what I see my role as, you know, to be a celebrator of sport, a celebrator of excellence, you know, again, come back, excellence, friendship, respect. You can, if I can, you know, hit those tones in the commentary, then I will feel like I have done my job. And you, know, you said, you know, from a broader standpoint, there is a role of media, you know, every, you know, and I've heard it said before, and it was certainly resonate when I was younger and, you know, you know more of my passion on my sleeve. You know, it's the, um, you know, you have athletes who wear their, you know, their sponsors on their sleeve, but they should also wear their values on their sleeve and, and use this platform as, you know, an ability to express the world that you want to see, you know, or the changes that you want to see made. Uh, and sometimes, uh, again, it can, you know, I feel like it can distract from what, you know, we're trying to achieve with sport. Um, but at other times, it's, uh, it's empowering. And I and this is, you know, this is where it comes to the individual journey, what do you want to get out of your sporting experience? You know, some people want to get this like hundred percent sporting experience and performance, and that's it, and then leave. You know, other people want to you know build up a platform and a status from which they can you know communicate a larger message and and use it as as a launching pad for you know you know another thing. Other people fall into that. Um, you know, likewise, it's you know it's our responsibility to you know to speak to the problems that we see in society and uh, make sure that the conversation is moving forward in a thoughtful and a respectful way. So I, yeah, there's, there's a lots of different roles with the media. And I also feel the need to finally say that yeah, as the Olympics are approaching and as we observe the Olympics, you'll notice that there's a very standard media cycle and that I distanced myself from it most games. The last games in Rio, I kind of got caught up into it because I was, I was researching, I was reading all the news articles, but usually about, um, you know, four, six, four months, six or four months before the Olympic games, there's just a lot of negative criticism about why the Olympics is awful, what's wrong with it, well, how corrupt it is, why are we keep spending all this money? Why are we doing this? And there doesn't seem to be any balance on the other side of, you know, what is good about sport and what is, what are we preserving and what is the, you know, what is the celebration? And then the Olympics happen, you know, the torch is lit and the fireworks go off and all of a sudden the critics start to silence and then the athletes start to perform and we see the majesty of youth and the innocence of athletics and the honesty of competition. And at the end, it's, you know, we're reminded again, why we keep doing the, the, this Olympics and why we have these sports, because again, the emotions are real, the emotions are raw, and they are 100% part of the athlete journey. And that's, that's the gift, you know, that's the gift. So I, yeah, I think media has a strong role to play. And, uh, you know, to, you know, we can get distracted by, you know, the criticisms and, you know, the politicking around the sport. And, 
I think there's an important role to play, you know, to communicate, continue to communicate the positive aspects and the inspirational stories that do come out of, um, out of the athlete journey. And you've done that. You've taken, you know, you're going to, you're going to play this role of color, color commentator, and you're really clear about the principles you want to uphold, but you've also started, and you called it a labor of love, your podcast called Row Row Tokyo. And I've listened to a number of them. They're beautiful. And uh, maybe you could talk a bit about your motivation behind that. Because in, in my mind, you're taking media and you're leveraging it in a way that, that is really powerful. And it's accessible to so many of us now. And Christina Walker has her own too, one of the rowers yes. on the team, right? Love that. So tell us a bit about your motivation. What makes it a labor of love? And I really want to ask you about, don't let me forget about 2000. And eight when you sang when you sang loud, right? Like, what was the motivation behind it? Don't let me forget that. But your wow. podcast, what's behind your podcast? What are your goals there? What's motivated you to to to, you know, to leverage media in that way? Well, let me just say the two thousand eight story because I think it's really okay. quick. And okay. the you know, we won won the Olympics and the flag was being raised and the uh, I remember thinking I'm either going to cry or I'm going to sing. And I just, I didn't want to cry. So I decided to sing. And so I started singing, saying loud, it was O Canada, and we were belting it out. And one of our, our training friends who was the triathlete at the time was watching uh, us. He's like, hey, I want to be on the podium. I want to be like that men's aide. I want to dominate. Um, and I want to sing. I want to sing like Creek, right? I always want to sing like he's belting out the national anthem. And so I'd say what motivated me in the moment was nothing more than the moment. Um, mm -hmm. There was... There was no thought whatsoever. It was simply, I just remember, you know, hugging Kyle and, you know, Dom who's beside me and just the thrill of, you know, of knowing that we've done it, you know, we've won it. And I'd say I was, I was proud to be Canadian at that moment, but I'd say more than that, I was proud to be a citizen of the world. Uh, I just felt the connection of, um, you know, connection to just the, the experience. And so that's, and what ended up happening was the, you know, the triathlete, Simon Whitfield, yeah. um, he ended up um, claiming that as part of his motivation for winning a silver medal later on in that Olympic games. He was coming into the, the final race, he's in fifth place and his coach yells at him, Simon, sing like Creek. He takes his hat and he throws it on the ground and sprints <laughs> and wins a silver medal. And so it goes to show you that there's sometimes when you are, you know, like when you're in your honest, virtuous self and just being, you know, the best you, you don't have the intention to inspire other people, but it happens. And I think that's, that's the real magic of, of the Olympics. And it's, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, ego and self-promotion can get in the way and, and give you a, a kind of a negative opinion of the motivations behind some athletes but i think you know the purity of sport is what keeps us coming back and the hope you know the hope is that we can we can keep that alive and i and i suppose you know to use that as a segue that's part of what motivated me to do the segue is to really help uncover you know the purity of sport from this next generation of athletes who are competing and training for um yeah, training for, for Tokyo 2020, well, Tokyo 2020, which is, although it's in 2021. And uh, yeah, I was motivated because I, one, I wanted to know more about these athletes and I wanted to have good information for my role as a commentator, uh, as the, um, you know, with the CBC. But more than that, I was curious about their athletic journey, what they were learning from it, I wanted to help affirm their athletic journey. I wanted to explore what they were learning, what they were you know, growing from, and you know, peel off the layers and go deeper and deeper and, and see if I could give, give voice to their values. And then more than that, I also wanted to find a way to capture the character of the crew. And I would say, yeah, and I was curious. I wanted to learn something. I'm I was curious of what I would what I would learn the most from running this podcast, and I thought it would be about the the journey. But I think the insight after having done the the conversations, you know, we interviewed every single crew, crew by crew, whether it was a single, a double, a pair, a four, uh, the eight, 
Um, what really stood out to me as a theme was this ability to commit and respect one another, you know, despite the differences in personality, despite the differences in values, uh, knowing that you have this higher united goal uh, that you can truly uh, commit under. And I don't see it with the same level of intensity in any other sport. You know, rowing, you know, the respect and the love and the care and the understanding of difference is so much higher in the sport of rowing than as it is in any other team sport that is out there. And I think that's what truly differentiates the top crews is their ability to find that unity in spite of difference and, uh, and really harness onto that top goal. And, and when we talk about the broader value and you think what's the meaning of sport and what's, what's the meaning of the sport of rowing? Cause I think I heard it said before, you know, all that winning a gold medal in rowing shows you is that you're able to sit on your butt, go backwards and do something absolutely useless and be the best at the world at it at one day, at one point in time, right? <laughs> and so the, you know, success is fleeting, but again, the values that are developed, which is, you know, the value of, of respect, of teamwork, of trust, of, of collectivism, of, you know, in, you know, in spite of differences is, is something that I think stays with the individual far beyond the, you know, the time in, in this sport, particularly at the sport of rowing and to, uh, you know, to life beyond. And, uh, and so I think that's, that's what stood out to me to the most of the podcast was the, you know, you know, beyond just the great stories that each of these athletes were telling and the journeys that they were on, um, just their, their dedication and love and understanding for the other individuals in their boat. And it was, it was truly, uh, truly inspiring. Love it. I have to agree. You know, I often will say the same and joke about going fast backwards in a boat. Woohoo. But, but it is so much more than that. Of course, it doesn't matter what sport you're doing, right. That just trying to do your best or knitting or whatever, play violin the the striving for that sort of perfection and of course it's so elusive in rowing you know I love watching people just stick with it it's so attractive to keep trying to learn how to find that balance and timing and all the beautiful elements of it love this idea too and, and we did a big reflection piece on our own crew and from 92 and came to the same conclusion it really had to do with that unity despite diversity right? and if you could find that unity and the shared something uh, and really bridge all the differences, but honor the differences, right? Mm -hmm. Not like you're all becoming this amal amalgamation or, right? Uh, it's beautiful process and needs good coaching and people who understand the principles and yeah. Well, I like how you say that because, you know, honoring the differences and mm -hmm. using those for success. And I, you know, I think of the women's pair it sticks out of my mind where you have, um, Kaylee Filmer in the bow seat, you know, is very kind of inspirational, um, effusive, loving, caring type of supportive type of person. And then um, you've got, you know, Hillary in the stroke seat, who's like very sharp and aggressive and on point and like you know, two very different personalities yet, they find a way to work together to make that boat go truly fast. And it's the, you know, it's the epitome of teamwork. And it's, uh, it's really inspiring to see. Yeah, lesson for the world. Okay, to finish, think about a, a race. What's a story that never got told about a race you'd love, you think needs to be told? That's so, often what's missing, I find. What? Like, these kind of interviews, you know? Wow. What was really cool? I don't know. I'm just thinking back to a lot of different races, but the one that pops into my mind was one, it's this World Cup that we had in Munich, I believe, or Ray, I'm trying to think if it was the World Championship or World Cup. And we ended up, there was a, a cable that came underneath 
the boat and we were going, it was 250 meters to go. And we, um, or more than that, it was maybe 400 meters to go. And we rode over the cable and it completely ripped off the fin from the bottom of our boat. And so Brian, all of a sudden our coxswain who, who steers the boat, like there's a, there's a really serious potential of something going wrong. And this, I guess, speaks to Brian's composure and his, um, his skill in that seat, in that roll of the boat. But we run over it and he's like, something hits the boat. He notices that he can't steer. He, he reaches around and he notices that like, the, fin, the fin is gone, but he just, he decides, I'm not going to tell them that. I just want to win the race. And if something goes wrong, then I'll tell like someone to ease off or like, you know, you know, row less hard or row harder on this side. And, and so we end up rowing. We finished the last you know, few hundred meters of the race with no fin, no rudder, crossed the finish line. I think we still we won the race and we got off the dock and we, we lifted up the boat and saw that the fin was completely gone. And it was, it was a boost of confidence, you know, that we could deal with that kind of, you know, equipment uh, malfunction and, and still come out the other side. But <laughs> it was crazy just to see and to think about that, you know, the disaster that could have happened had we gone off course. But I guess you're going so fast and so straight that the boat, it stayed on its, uh, stayed on its line. So. I love that story. And I love that, that it was a coxswain's composure and not to assume it's going to go wrong. Because some people might just go, oh, God, we lost our fifth it's all over, you know, I'm going to start to flounder and, and go off and, and he just sort of waited. Maybe I won't. I love yeah. that. That's a huge yeah. lesson in life. Hey, eh? good old coxies. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I could keep you all day, I'm sure, and just keep asking for more and more stories. But uh, I really appreciate spending the time with you. And, and I really appreciate the work you're doing with your podcast. I was incredibly impressed with the work uh, that you did with Kaylee and, Hil and Hillary around their pair and the way that you uh, three together really challenged the stigma around mental illness. All three of you were incredibly brave. And I thought, wow, that that's what I'm talking about. You know, using the platform to challenge stigma issues, uh, things that are not right in the world. And you did it beautifully. You facilitated that, but you also oh were so authentic in your sharing your own story so thank you for that yeah well and i think it was uh, i didn't set out to challenge any stigma right? and it's it's simply you know what i had set out to do was hold space so that this athletes could share their stories as i as authentically and honestly as they could and it was it was amazing and it's funny how we had the conversation and there's no hint you know, we, we have these talks about mental illness and stigma and, you know, I'm, you know, I know my father dealt with some very serious mental illness when, you know, when I was young and there, there was a lot of like shame and guilt and embarrassment around, but now it was, it was fascinating just having the conversation with, um, with Kaylee and just how it's just like, it's just another thing. It's like talking about a broken leg or a broken rib and, okay, you know, ain't no thing but a chicken wang. Let's just, let's just keep talking about it. <laughs> and so I'm, uh, that's, um, yeah, that's something that I hadn't really realized about the podcast until you, until you mentioned it. So that's, um, that's fascinating. That's powerful. And it will help a lot of, a lot of kids, uh, whether they're athletes or not, to overcome that weird stigma and shame. And because here, here's this very successful athlete just confronting the two successful confronting it, acknowledging it as, as an injury that we can overcome and together with support and so many things. So I want to give a shout out to that particular episode because it was very powerful. And if anything, you know, it's going to, um, I think, make their competitors fear them even more because, wow, holy strong, strong unit, aren't they? Thanks so much, Anna. You're doing such great work in the world. And uh, I'll share the recording with you after. Okay. I appreciate this. Be well. I'm just going to stop.